On behalf of Passive House Accelerator and our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, welcome to Reimagine Buildings Electrification. So we're going to talk about putting the right hot water heater uh, it, at the right place at the right time. Um, and to speak just about scale for one second, Gary was speaking about uh, single family applications and piping diameter and stuff like that. Our scale is more projects on the order of uh, city city blocks. So we're going to jump from uh, single family to, to multifamily scale projects pretty quickly. So we're going to touch on uh, the types of heat pump, heat pump hot water heaters that are available on the market. And we're going to basically run through do's and don'ts for, for each. We're going to start small, uh, you know, small unitized heat pump models. We're going to step into mid-sized split systems that can be thought of as uh, mini or medium-sized splits. And then we're going to close talking about larger centralized systems uh, that are air source, ground source, or even black water source heat pump systems that we're starting to actively deploy on our projects. So let's start with the small stuff first, which is closest to what Gary was talking about, which is a small unitized package unit. Uh, you know, this is like a stand-up storage unit uh, that might go in a cellar or in a closet, like is shown in the pictures on, on the right, more geared towards a single family home project, uh, might historically be gas fired or electric resistance coil or something like that. Uh, but with uh, heat pump technology, which can improve the efficiency of these systems greatly, and of course, bring us to electrification. You can see uh, the picture on the left, the storage component on the bottom, and then the darker component on the top is the actual heat pump being brought inside and packaged, an air source heat pump being packaged with the unit. Um, and this is a unit that will source the heat from the air and then uh, turn that into heated hot water for, for our use, of course. It's ideally best in a single family style cellar uh, because it will actually cool the surrounding space a little bit uh, because it needs to source its heat from the air as an air source heat pump does. And so like in the summertime, you get the benefit of dehumidification. You don't have to run a dehumidifier in your cellar or something like that. But we can also uh, and have successfully used these in a more centralized fashion to start to take on, uh, I'll say limited groups of apartments you know, one of these can serve an apartment or a single family house, two can say serve two apartments, maybe three can now pick up four or five apartments and four can maybe pick up seven to eight to 10 apartments and stuff like that. So while this is designed uh, at a product level for kind of a one-to-one -one use, we can group them and access the simplicity of a very cost-effective package product and actually get a heat pump uh, of this scale to serve 10, 20, 30 apartments. Unfortunately, with any technology, things can go wrong. And so on the don't side, uh, we've seen a lot of things go wrong. We've been brought in to help rescue a contractor in trouble or a project in distress. We do a lot of peer reviews um, and, and, uh, and otherwise. So any don't listed in my slides actually result from things that we have seen go wrong, unfortunately. So, Let's remind ourselves what a heat pump is for a second. A heat pump moves heat, right? If this was a gas hot water heater, we burn gas, uh, the combustive reaction sets us off heat, and we use that heat to heat hot water. Whereas a heat pump takes heat out of the air in this case and just moves it into the water. So when we're running this unit, we're actually cooling the surrounding space so what that means is you actually don't want to put it in an apartment, say, within the conditioned space. Uh, and that's unfortunately represented in the picture on the left. What ends up happening is you cool the space to heat hot water, and then your heating system actually has to pick that up. And the net overall efficiency of a system like this drops on the order of about a third. So the picture on the right more accurately represents what we need to do with these unitized units. We actually have to duct. Gary was talking about how these units have air filters because they are air source, and we want to keep the process air out of the conditioned environment and optimize the overall efficiency of the system overall. 
All right, so stepping up, let's say I have a project that's more than 10, 20, 30 apartments or something like that. We might start to talk about split systems. Uh, they can be on the mini scale, which is kind of like the picture on the top left. This is a heat pump uh, by Sanko Sandin that is meant to be like one-to-one, -one, could be one-to-one -one with a house or an apartment. Uh, we could also start to twin together larger scale condensing units. A lot of the VRF manufacturers do this. That picture is a Dakin MegaQ product where we could twin together three, six VRF condensing units and perhaps pick up 20, 30, 50, 80, 80 some odd apartments, something like that. As we start to talk about systems like this, uh, we really have to start to think about right sizing the system, uh, its capacity and storage alike. Uh, the gas fired systems, the fossil fired systems of old used to produce a lot of instantaneous hot water immediately. Heat pumps are not really, uh, the technology hasn't gotten to a point to be able to do that yet. So when you deploy heat pump water heating systems, you deploy heat pumps with a decent amount of storage and the storage serves as a thermal battery that's primarily charged overnight when we're sleeping and then we get up and we uh, start to use hot water and the energy in the tanks slowly wanes. The heat pumps run during the day and it has to be right sized uh, to make sure that the system will function and people don't run out of hot water. So as you start to get into more complicated systems like this, of course, uh, you, you want to engage a qualified engineering firm like, like mine to, to do these things to size properly. And of course, when we're talking about a split system, now we're introducing some form of refrigerant because in the package that we saw before, the heat pump sits on top of the storage tank. This is a heat pump split from the storage itself. So the one-to-one -one split units uh, might only go 25 to 50 feet or so. So you have to be very careful about where you put the condensing unit and how far away it is from the storage and also might uh, limit the size of application. Whereas the VRF manufacturers can get 100, 200, 300 feet of, of refrigerant split um, and obviously serve an application that may be tall or, or wide or both. Uh, and then, of course, we have to think of, start to think about the global warming potential embodied in the refrigerant itself. The mini split on, on this slide actually uses R744, which is CO2 as the refrigerant, which has a GWP of one. And obviously, more traditional refrigerants have a higher global warming uh, potential embodied. On the don't side of these things, uh, we have unfortunately seen both of these things go wrong. Uh, first, you need to make sure that the heat pump system you specify is rated for cold climate. Uh, we're in midtown Manhattan. Uh, it's been 12 degrees a lot this week. And the heat pumps of old have struggled to actually make heated hot water at low temperatures. So the, the heat pumps traditionally would only make hot water down to maybe 40 degrees or so. That would be suitable for maybe a climate North Carolina, Florida, further south, something like that. Uh, and unfortunately, we've seen folks specify and deploy those systems in a, in a cold climate like New York, and you can run out of hot water or need a lot of electric resistance backup, which is not quite as efficient. The other thing is um, we have to think in a cold climate about the media that's in the piping. We have refrigerant, but we also are making hot water. So if we're going to put hot water outside, it can freeze. So this piping, of course, needs to be heat traced or may need glycol. We might need secondary heat exchangers. And of course, if we're going to rely on something like heat tracing, we want to make sure that we have emergency power uh, available as well. All right, so let's keep getting bigger. Let's start talking about the large scale centralized stuff and let's start with air source heat pumps. Picture on the right is a product by AirMech and it's effectively an air source a uh, chiller, it's, a, it's an air-cooled chiller that runs in reverse as an air source heat pump. Each of those V modules may look like a chiller to anyone who's familiar with a chiller. Um, and here now we can start to get larger capacity outputs and start to support, you know, hundreds of apartments and hundreds of users, let's say, with, with the right size storage. Here again, though, we have to really think about uh, refrigerant and first, again, from the global warming uh, potential and the embodied carbon therein, but more specifically here, that can directly affect the efficiency, uh, the heating efficiency known as the COP or the coefficient of performance. Uh, so like 
There are some systems that use R744 again CO2, as you can see on the bottom of the slide, with an embodied carbon of, of one. Uh, but unfortunately, the operating efficiency of those systems are lower than those that use the more traditional refrigerants. And R410A is, of course, being phased out with the EPA's rule sets. We're being pushed to R32, R513A, and things like that uh, to help mitigate global warming potential effects regardless. But the traditional systems have more GWP in the refrigerant, but run at a higher operating efficiency and vice versa. So that's one trade-off that needs to be considered. The other thing is that the CO2 units can produce 180 degrees or so instantaneously, whereas the other more traditional refrigerant-based units may make 130, 140, 150. And we know that to prevent the spread of Legionella, uh, when we store hot water, we need to be at 140 degrees or above. So there are certain circumstances where uh, even these large-scale units may need electric resistance backup and the like. So there's a lot to kind of weigh and consider there and handle correctly, um, but it can certainly be done and we deploy plenty of, we've, we've deployed and are deploying plenty of these systems. The other thing is you can probably read from the picture, these things are big and, and weigh a lot and you need to coordinate with the structural engineering team about how they're sited. Each one of those V sections use, usually weigh about 2,500 pounds. We might be into thousands of gallons of storage and that'll have a weight too. So of course needs to be considered as we get to these larger scale systems. Uh, we have unfortunately seen on other projects that uh, these need 480 volt electricity. Uh, you know, the, the electricity power in my computer is running at 12208 volts. Um, so step up transformers are needed. Some of the manufacturers are responding to this and, and are providing transformers skidded with the equipment. Um, but it's something that can certainly be missed and cause a, a snag in, in construction. And then as I talk about the large scale systems, I will just harp on these two points a couple of times. As you get more complicated, uh, the one line diagrams, the pumping arrangement, the sequence of operation, the staging of the tanks, there's baffling involved and tanks in series and all sorts of stuff. You really do want to work with a qualified firm and contracting team. And this is not the type of system to skimp on proper startup and commissioning. Um, we have seen that that go wrong as these systems get more complicated and it's definitely an area of focus. Another large scale system uh, that we're starting to deploy is, is geothermal heat pumps, uh, not only for hot water, but for HVAC within the building alike. And this of course revolves around digging wells under the building. So we move from air source to water source heat pumps. Of course, we'd have to go into this with eyes open. There's larger hard costs and it's a larger scale endeavor, but it, it brings a higher operation, higher operational efficiency. There's a lot of local and federal incentives uh, in, in our New York city-based operation, uh, the kind of clean heat program offers incentives, the Inflation Reduction Act nationally brings large scale incentive tax credits to the table. Uh, NYSERDA in our jurisdiction uh, also offers incentives in this types of space. And then as we move from air source to water source equipment, we have to think also about pumping efficiency, right? Because there's no pumps involved in air source. So pumps with variable frequency drives, high efficiency motors and control sequences become more important to make sure that the system operates at peak efficiency. On the don't side, um, there's a lot of complexity with load balancing and managing water temperatures coming out of a ground source loop. So you'll certainly want to work with a qualified team to make sure that that's right. And again, just to continue to harp on it, the one line diagrams, the details, the sequences of operation and startup and commissioning matter a, a whole lot as you're dealing with a system of this complexity. I'm going to close talking about black water source heat pumps, uh, which if you have, I hope you've heard of these. And if you haven't, uh, we're certainly starting to bring these to our projects as a kind of an ultimate gesture of circularity. Heat pumps, uh, these heat pumps can be designed to the highest efficiency on the market because they like a tight source temperature. Our sewers and our sewer, our sanitary waste streams from buildings run very consistently between 50 and 70 degrees. And the uh, when you design a heat pump into that, that's where super high efficiency comes. Uh, and that's why we, we push for these systems. I would caveat that you should certainly understand the system before you pitch it to others. We've had some very interesting conversations when you start to mention black water and domestic water production in the same sentence. 
Uh, so be careful there. One of uh, our local vendors, leading suppliers, also acknowledges that maintenance is, maintenance is scary. There's grinding pumps on the Blackwater side, as an example. Uh, so they offer a turnkey solution that can be brought to the table. And on the don't side, again, you know, this is a complicated setup. Uh, so the one line, the startup and commissioning matters. I always like to close with a challenge anytime I uh, have the opportunity to speak. And so as we speak about something as, as lofty as this, I would, I would say let's not be afraid to challenge ourselves and others. Circularity and maximal system performance lies within. So please uh, push. Don't be afraid to push for this. Ask questions. Uh, and let's tackle electrification together. Thank you all so much for your time for uh, attending today. It's been a pleasure for all of us.